Now we're back with The Breakfast and Plus TV Africa. We head to, you know, the issues of the economy. The Central Bank of Niger, that's the CBN, has raised the monetary policy rate. The MPR has stated to 15.5% from 14% in an aggressive move to fight inflation in the country. The governor of the Central Bank of Niger, Mr. Godwin Emefili, disclosed this while briefing the press at the end of the fifth Monetary Policy Committee meeting in 2022, of course, in Abuja. He also announced an increase in the cash reserve ratio, which is uh, a minimum of 32.5% from July, CRR of 22.5%, while the retaining liquidity ratio at 30%. The governor said that members deliberated on the impact of the widening margin between the current policy rate of 14% and the inflation rate of 20.52%. Uh, we have Ogbonaya Kuku who joins us. He is an investment and economic development expert. He joins us uh, all the way from the United States of America. Ogbonaya, it's good to have you join us this morning. Yeah, thank you for having me, Mercy. All right, then let's quickly talk about the rate. What does that mean? I mean, the 15% from 14% to 15.5%, what does that really mean? Because these are very technical terminologies. Yeah, it's as simple as um, interest rate. Interest rate is basically how much monies will be worth, the worth of money when you want to borrow money. So if you want to borrow money from the bank now, is going to be above, it has to be above 15% because if the rate is 15.5% given to the banks, that's the commercial banks from the central bank. So that means by the time they add their commercial, um, their, 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 their cost of funds, management fee, and all of that. So the funds will be above 20% at the end of the day. So for any business that wants to borrow money, uh, it means that you have to borrow it at, you know, at a higher interest rates. That also on the flip side, it also means that people that have monies in the bank would also want to uh, keep their monies in the bank for a higher interest. So that is, you know, that's the, that's the easiest way to explain what just happened. Well, but what would you say that uh, the implication would be for the Nigerian economy now? Now, um, I always try to define um, the role of the central bank and then the physical, monetary, uh, uh, physical policy uh, managers as a in a football team, the strikers and the defenders. Now, the central bank are the defenders, while the fiscal policy managers are the strikers. Now, the success of a team is highly premised on what the strikers do than what the defenders do. Now, it is when the strikers are not doing well that the, 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 the game you know, pushes back to the defender. So the defender is now trying, struggling to see how they can you know, you know, stop goals from entering into their, uh, into their own goal post. Now, I try to break this down so that everybody will understand that the central bank, where they are right now, all they're trying to do is try whatever means to see how they can you know, sh you know, shield the economy from going down. But nevertheless, whatever it is that they do will not be able to help the economy bounce back. I say that because, like I said, if the fiscal policy managers are not turning out policies, programs that will keep the economy liquid, it will become imminently difficult for any central bank to support the economy. You see, we've been shouting ever since. Whether you like it or not, the implications are, one, you're going to make cost of production go higher too, because if you're trying to mop up liquidity within the system, it also means that those who are taking monies from the local banks who are producing, and you see local industries have had issues. They've been struggling since post COVID. So if, interest rate becomes higher for them to borrow, it becomes, cost of cost of living becomes higher. Goods and services become a, a bit more expensive. So, you see, it's, it's just that they're in a dilemma. There's really nothing they can do at this point. See, was that why we were shouting. All the programs that the central bank kept on doing, all the interventions, see, they spent over $9 trillion on intervention. If these things were pioneered by the fiscal money, uh, fiscal, uh, fiscal money, 
fiscal policy managers, it would have been a lot easier. It has a way of jump-starting the economy. So if these things are sustainable, it would have been able to bring in a whole lot into the economy. But as it is now, it's a very tough one. Well, so um, you, you stated that, I mean, in the course of all of this, you have mentioned that uh, the CBN is trying to manage the economy and not ensuring that the economy goes down. But it feels like we're going down yeah. already. And so um, w what would you say that uh, the CBN is doing that the economy is going down? That's what I'm saying. It is beyond the Central Bank of Nigeria. It is what the, 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 the policy makers, the, 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 the National Assembly, the, those who are in the executive, is what they do that would actually help the economy better. So what are the policies that we have concerning agriculture? What are the programs that we have concerning education, research and development, the oil and gas? What are we doing to see that there's a robust economy? What do we do? Because the service industry, are we doing anything to support the service industry? So these are key things that, you know, that support the will of development in any economy. So if we are all still, see, this country is import dependent. Okay, let's say we are import dependent. Countries exist that depend on importation. Have you, and we're having revenue issue. And a country as huge as Nigeria that depends so much on, on importation, we don't even have a shipping line. So we depend on people to even get the goods into our country. And we are crying over not having enough liquidity, we don't have monies in our economy, we're having revenue issues, we're borrowing to support the economy to pay salaries and all of that. So it, there, there's so much to be done. See, the infrastructure, we, we have issues with infrastructure, input in agriculture, we, so name it, when it comes to power. So you don't even know where to hold. So my point is, the CPN is trying to defend as again, it is not their role to, 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 to get the economy uh, moist. No, it's not their job. Their job is to, to, to defend the economy, you know, with monetary policies. Now, the physical policy uh, managers are the ones who are supposed to, you know, bring up programs, policies that will help the economy to stay afloat. No, but, um, okay, so now, I mean, it's very clear what you're saying, that uh, it is not the CBN's responsibility. They're only acting... So if you have all of the policies the CBN is putting out, they're only acting uh, in accordance to what they're expected to do. They're doing what they're expected to yeah. do at the end of the day. And that's what they're doing, right? But uh, however, yeah. the, the president especially, uh, if you look at it in terms of agriculture, the president said that uh, his policy on agriculture has actually saved the country from a collapse, what you like to say. And really, he's talked about we must grow what we eat and we have to uh, eat what we grow. We have always been very conscious of need to achieve food security in Nigeria and to encourage local farmers and uh, the real economy. This country was one dependent on foreign rice. And so rice has been a major you know, concern for this administration. Uh, and so uh, this administration has been big on saying we have been on the plus in terms of production of rice and what have you. I'd like to share your thoughts on that. Closing okay, the now, border, um, not forgetting you... that we have closed the border to foreign rice to ensure that local production uh, tops the charts and that we're able to, you know, consume what we're producing. Uh, I'd like to, you to share your thoughts on this one. Now, this is, this is what it is. Um, I, I believe that I want to use the rice issue as a, you know, as, as a test case when it comes to taking strong decisions to see how you can become productive. Now, a lot was done. The Anchor Borrowers Program was initiated, piloted, you know, fully supported by the Central Bank of Nigeria because they brought the, the, the necessary investment that was required to drive that process. Now, farmers were engaged, you understand, you know, big people started emailing rice and all. Now, don't also forget, as soon as that began to happen, there were other external influence that hit our food belt. I use food belt because, I mean, if insurgence, insurgency and all of that began to hit where this production or this, because it, Rice production is basically, you know, farm and then meal, 
So if the farmers can't go to farm, of course, that particular program was already sabotaged from day one. Now, the other issue here is if our raw material supply strategy is not as good, and then if you're talking about raw material, basically over 60% of most raw material comes from agriculture. So if we're, look, we're looking at wheat, we're looking at sorghum, we're looking at sugar. So if the, if the productive, if, if we did not become productive within those fair, it becomes difficult for you to see results in the economy generally. Now there was an intention for us to begin to grow what we eat. There was an intention for that to happen. Now the process began. Did we achieve milestones? Did we Not achieve the some of the milestones? Of course we did. Obona. Uh, the president yeah, stated that Nigerians are now eating, because we actually, you know, ban importation of foreign rice, uh, the president stated categorically that Nigerians are eating local rice. That's what it is. And so, of course, why are we still course, grappling with it? Are, are, are we really eating local rice? I mean, we're eating the rice that we produce. Yeah. The Abakli K rice. No, we, yes, we I don't are, remember the last are, time I had it. So, because no, I haven't been Abakaliki. eating it. I'm eating... Gone, no, no, no. No, Messi, we've gone beyond abakaliki rice. So what are we... We can now do... No, we are doing proper... Right, we're doing, doing proper milling. So there are so, so much that you eat in the market that you don't know that they are made locally. But that does not negate the fact that they have become more expensive. Because other factors are now in you know you have to include cost of production cost of transportation which is still high so yes we have produced locally it has become more expensive it's easier i could tell people it's easier to move goods from china to macmillan bus stop in ibado than to move goods from edo state to uh, a papa wharf these are these are these are issues that affect you know productivity in every economy. So yes, we try to do that, but don't also forget that we still we were still dependent on importation when it comes to wheat, because these are things that you use for things like you know staple foods like rice. Rice was not sorry like bread. So you see, it, we solved the problem, but we still had more problems. Even the problem we tried to solve, we didn't solve completely because we had security issues, we still had infrastructure issues. So, so the cost of production, the cost of logistics was still very high or still remains high. So, it's, you see, economy is like you will. It, until you're able to solve the entire, you know, the entire, you know, compartment of the wheel and there's a confluence, an agreement of, you know, bringing out the full result it become, it is never complete. You always find yourself shooting yourself you know, in the foot at every point in time. So there has to be a comprehensive program on education. There has to be a comprehensive program on, on, on a financial engineering strategy. There has to be a, a, you know, market identification and supply, supply, uh, supply chain, a, a, you know, uh, a, a full supply chain structure. There has to be... Um, uh, what I call raw material supply strategy for it to work. So if we are still depend, if most industries still depend on import, you have not solved the problem. But for me, what happened with the Ancoboras program was to show, yes, it is possible. I expected the government that immediately we noticed that there was a, a serious problem of insurgency in the north. Would have faced the south where we face crops like cassava, where we, we can also you know get things like glucose syrup, Okay, let me give you a very simple example. Nigeria is the largest producer of cassava in the world. Thailand is the second largest producer of cassava in the world. Thailand earns about $2 billion from cassava every year. Nigeria makes less than $100 million from cassava every year. So that's to show you what it means when you produce something and you don't add value to it. Well, so, I mean, if you look at all of this... We started with agriculture because we know that the Buhari administration has been great on agriculture. 
and what have you. But you have analysis and reports saying that it's been the weakest, if you look at it, because we're growing, the sector is growing at about 15.5%, juxtaposing that with, you know, all, uh, other government or other administration. Uh, for instance, uh, the one before the uh, Buhari administration, which is the Jonathan, which was at 13 point, about 5%, if I'm not mistaken. And so um, would it be very rational to say that we have been very great on what we're, what con we are eating, what we're producing? That's the question. You, you said that the products will be very expensive, but I can categorically tell you that the rice that I consume every day is not local rice, it's not made in Nigeria. We're still importing, even with the fact that the government has said we have banned importation of foreign rice. So what exactly like, are we uh, even doing well, with ourselves, really? Because it's not foreign mm -hmm. rice. It's not made in Nigeria. So even, even if we have said that we are making this rice, but I can tell you that the rice that I have been eating, which is very expensive, is not made in Nigeria. It's still an imported rice. So first, what was the essence of even saying we're, you know, banning foreign no, importation? No, uh, I'm not trying to be an advocate for the government. Of All course, I'm just I trying know. to do here is to make you understand that you cannot. These are things. Yes, you can promise heaven. You can promise heaven on earth, but the reality is, is a process. It takes time. Okay. Like I, I, I always use the, 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 the GSM thing. When it started, GSM was so expensive. The SIM card was so expensive. But now SIM, SIM card is almost free. Now it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, it's an outcome from, it comes from either a scale when you scale. When your production, when there's a when it's, when you do scaling your production, so that means more people have to go into farming, uh, more people have to go into agriculture. The, you see, it's all about perception. Now, the perception in, in investing in agriculture became, you know, something that a lot of young people were all becoming very interested in. Now, everybody now would would have been putting so much money in agriculture, if not for insecurity. Because if you see good results, if you see good numbers in agriculture, do you definitely see people, you know, gravitating towards, moving towards, okay, this is the safest place to put money, which is another disadvantage to, you know, you know what we we're talking about earlier. When you raise interest rates, people now see a comf see, see more comfortable to just, you know, put their monies in the bank and expect returns without doing anything. So, you see, if whether you meet see rice that is imported rice on the shelves. Yes, of course you will see. Now, from the CBM books, you have to now ask, how many from M have we done on importation of rice? They will tell you they've not done, you know, so much. There has been some high, drastic reduction of money spent on importation of rice. So every rice that you're seeing probably just came illegally. But, I mean, or government try to augment because we keep saying we keep underrating our population and rice is one of the most consumed food or commodity in nigeria so if government needed to import or support you know give license to some few people to bring in rice to augment the ones that we are producing due to the fact that plans didn't work because of insurgency i keep no no that wasn't that wasn't the case i mean very explicit okay. it was said that there was an there was a ban on foreign production and that was i mean foreign rice or whatever it is you know we didn't allow all of that the essence of the ban was to encourage local production the president had categorically stated that we're already eating what we're producing really in terms of rice. i'm not earlier. even even well, going earlier. to other parts i remember very well Messi, sorry if i can remember very well that was earlier when the, the the borders were shut, they shut the borders, you know, because you know they still, you know, used to move rice from some of those uh, borders in, you know, into Nigeria. So the borders were shut to support these industries because man, a lot of all these um, uh, rice farmers, you know, associations said, no, we can't start producing unless you know some of these things, these measures were taken, and the measures were taken, and some of these companies have jump started, they've started working. There are people, there are big, big million. You can't, you, won't, you can't even begin to imagine. Try and do small research on how much production that we do now in Nigeria, from almost zero to 
almost every state in Nigeria having, you can imagine Lagos State having a partnership with Kebi State at one point where Kebi State was producing in tons of, you know, uh, you know, tons of millions of tons of rice to supply to Lagos State. So these things have moved from where they, where they were to where they, they, we've not gotten to where we want to be. Like I said, there were, there were, dis, there were disruptions. There were things that happened that were not part of the plan. If not, we would have we have exceeded this particular level. I understand where you're coming from. It's clearly, you see, like I said earlier, it's, it's something you have to you have to have a robust plan on security. So these things will continue to happen until you're able to get it right. Good, but uh, let's let's move away to another part of this conversation. We talk, which, which talks about uh, uh, the announcement that was made on an increase in the cash reserve ratio. Uh, to a minimum of 32.5 percent. Prior to that, it was 22.5 percent. Right. Yeah. First, my question would be, what does this mean? While they are retaining the ratio of 30 percent, what does this really mean? Because this is, you know, technical terms uh, that's very specific to this particular sector. So I'd like you to explain okay. uh, the fact that we're moving from 22.5% uh, to 32.5%. Okay, so what it means is that, let's say uh, Bank A, you have 100,000 naira. So what you have to leave within Central Bank, what you have to leave within Central Bank will be less... Tw less um, um, 22.5% or the, the actual 32.5%. So you can only work with the, uh, you can only work with, um, that's, I can't do my math, math is very well right now. You can only do, you know, work with the remaining. You can only loan from the remaining. So that's what it simply means. So you can't work beyond that circumference. So that is as simple as that. Mm. Let's talk about yeah. inflation. Uh, inflation has also been part of it. And when we talk about inflation, usually it might not just be easy for uh, an ordinary Nigerian to understand what it is. So when we say that uh, inflation is on the high, we're looking at the figures now. Uh, what does that mean? It simply means that um, the, the, there, you have lots of money pursuing less goods. So the cost of goods will continue to, you know, surge high because you have too much money trying to buy a particular commodity. So um, it, it makes so there's there's scarcity of goods, you know, there's scarcity of goods. So it makes goods more expensive. So um, what the central bank is now trying to do is to reduce the amount of money. You know, trying to chase, chasing after a particular those goods, so that it will now, you know, that sometimes most most cases, you know, drives the cost of uh, cost of goods, you know, you know, downwards. So that's actually basically what um, inflation is. You know, trying to you know break it down as you know as you know, as elementary as I can, because whether you like it or not, if you are having issues with um, uh, most of your most of the most of the uh, Consumer goods that you have are, are all imported. You're having FX issues. So it makes the cost of goods more expensive. And then if you have a lot of liquidity, it will also increase the amount of people chasing after that particular good. So it becomes the case of the highest bidder. So the what of your, you know, what of your of your monies will continue to, you know, go down. Well, so, but, but generally now, uh, we're looking at the fact that the inflation rate is at 19.64%. And, uh, of course, 2.27% uh, point higher compared to the rate recorded in July, that's in 2021, which is 17.38%. My question is, what does this mean now? What does this mean to an average man? Because when we have all of the statistics and all of this figure, it might just almost be difficult and impossible to understand the dynamics and what it means in terms of spending what money, buying and selling. What does this mean to us? No, for every consumer, everybody should have at the back of their mind that um, if, if you used to buy... Um, you used to buy a plate of rice for 100 naira, so you're going to be buying it for, um, you know, 
uh, maybe 120 naira or 150 naira because I mean it has a multiplier effect. So if the inflation rate by records, you know, by statistics gives you that it's about it's an increase from the you know 2.75 percent increase. So in reality, in real terms, when you get into the market, it's going to be a lot higher than that. So um, everybody should know that cost of goods are going to get higher. And um, uh, not only that, it's still going, I, I believe it's going to get higher than this because that's, you see, we're entering an election year. So there's going to be a lot of um, spending on electioneering. You know, uh, there's going to be a lot of, uh, you know, there'll be a lot of um, uh, 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 what profit taking from, you know, from investments. A lot of investors will pull out their resources. It's just a natural occurrence. It's not like there's anything wrong. It's a natural thing. If you had money uh, and then there's going to be a scrubble, if you have money in a pot and there's going to be a scrubble in that room, the first thing you do is to take your money out because where a man's treasure is, that's where his heart is. So no investor will leave his or her money in an economy where there's going to be, you know, a struggle, a struggle, political struggle. So they will do like, uh, they will stand on the fence to watch and see what direction. But I doubt what there are risk takers, you know, the huge risk takers who will still say, okay, either way, I know I'm going to be comfortable. And then there are also those who cannot take out their investment because the kind of investment they have are not the ones that you take out on, you know, but this will actually affect the, the portfolio investors more. Those are people who play in the capital market. There's going to be a lot of um, profit taking. People will stand on the fence to watch to see what will happen. So pretty much whether you like it or not, there's going to be, uh, the inflation is going to get higher, you know, in real terms. Now, so quickly now, I was just throw this. Nigeria would become 62 in a few days. What would be your thoughts on the economy and uh, what should we do? More like uh, the issues and maybe the solutions. Now, I, I said that, you know, you know one, one of the reasons why I'm here in, in the U.S. because, um, you know, we had some huge investment summit, uh, you know, as one of the side events at the United Nations um, General Assembly. Now, um, when I was interviewed, I said it very, I said, it, you know, clearly, anytime you call, investors will come. Why are they coming? Because the truth be told, yes, we have issues. Yes, when it is, it's not the most favorable place to put money. But the thing is, Nigeria is one of the most untapped nation when it comes to economy, economically. It's an, it's an untapped economy. Solid mineral, untapped. Infrastructure, investment in infrastructure to, you know, to, to when it comes to public-private partnership, untapped. Services, untapped. A country with over 200 million people untapped. So this is to show you that it, when it comes to our economy, Nigeria is still a virgin land. The only place that we have, even the oil and gas, untapped. I say untapped because we have not even been able to add value to the oil and gas. So this is a nation where if we have leadership, if we have People who understand that every second means something. Monies are invested. Monies are not thrown around. People who understand prudence, pay attention. Pay attention to the people that pay attention to details. Processes. It will. You, see, you would be shocked at what you will be marvelled at what this country will become. I say this. I always. Uh, you see, I always use that a very simple example. What we play over, what we play politics with, which is, have you ever heard them talking about Ruga, uh, whether cattles, all those kind of stories? In Botswana, what manufacturing contributes to Nigerians' GDP is exactly what cow contributes to the GDP of Botswana. So even the cattle that we are rearing, that's supposed to help us, because Botswana is one of the highest, they are one of the highest exporters of beef to Europe. So... Cow leg, cow leg in Botswana is sold for 25, uh, for, for 25 pula. 25 pula is approximately 700 naira. So if you buy the four cow legs, they will give you the head of the cow free of charge. <laughs> well, that's so a lot. Is that what we are, what, yeah, to okay, say, we what need to go now. I'm being printed to Yeah, it's... <laughs> yeah, it's okay. We'll it's go okay. now, Kuku. We, no, we, we have to Botswana. go now. I mean, uh, do, I think that that's even fair. 700 naira... 
<laughs> and having a cow head, we probably would be having many cow heads in Nigeria. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Obuna Ikuko, for being part of the show this morning. I mean, we look forward to sharing more of your thoughts as we proceed to 2023. All right. Thank you for having me. Well, we're out of time. We've been speaking with a developmental economist right there, and uh, he's in the United States of America. Thank you so much, Ukuku, for being part of the show. We'll take a break, and when we return, we'll be looking at the second conversation. The president, Mohammed Buhari, has inaugurated a Council on Climate Change, and we'll talk about that. Stay with us. <laughs>